Fail Frame 4 Mask of the Lunar Eclipse is a game that's always intrigued me but remained just out of reach, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that sentiment. Being the only game in the series to not see a release outside of Japan, very few fans of the Fail Frame franchise and even fewer fans of horror games in general have had the opportunity to experience it. But why exactly has this installment eluded the Western market? Well, I think I'll hand it off to Tango Mushi to give you a quick history lesson. Mask of the Lunar Eclipse was the first Fatal Frame game to be developed for a Nintendo system. With the upgrade in hardware capabilities of the Wii compared to the PS2 and Xbox, the developers opted for a more action-orientated third-person camera angle instead of the fixed cameras of the earlier games. The game's director, Makoto Shibata, and producer, Keisuke Kikuchi, also wanted to use the Wii mode as a way to heighten the player's immersion. This was achieved by tying the movement of the Wii mode to the character's flashlight and camera. Audio would also play through the remote and rumble to make scary moments more intense. Shibata wanted the link between sound and memory to be an important theme in the game. Music boxes, pianos, and radios play a much bigger part here, and in several instances, hearing music helps a character remember something, much like it can do in real life. The game's setting is the biggest departure in the series so far, taking place on a remote, no longer inhabited Japanese island. The environments were designed using old Western-style Japanese houses as reference, and it provides a fresh experience to fans of the previous games. The developers worked closely with Nintendo, who made sure the game was scary enough and that the story would have no major plot holes. When it was released in July 2008, it received fairly positive reviews, averaging 7 to 8 out of 10, and in its first four months it sold 75,000 copies, making it the best-selling game in the series so far. Yet, compared to other Wii titles, its sales were lacking, which is thought to be one of the reasons Nintendo decided against translating the game and releasing it outside of Japan. Either that, or it was due to a possible dispute between Nintendo and Tecmo regarding desired changes and bug fixes for the Western release. Fans of the series were left confused and in need of answers, as there had been evidence that suggested Nintendo had planned a European release but had since gone back on that decision. Fatal Frame 4 has remained a Japan exclusive, at least until recently, when Koei Tecmo revealed that it would receive the same re-release treatment that its sequel did in 2021, bringing a remastered version to all modern consoles with an official English translation in March 2023. But we'll ignore the re-release for now, because I played and captured the footage for this video on the original Wii version. How did I do so, you say? Well, I happen to own a Japanese copy of the game which, when run through an English patch program on the Homebreed Wii console, will allow you to play the game in English. Well, no, that's not entirely true. That was my original intention, but after hours of troubleshooting, I discovered that you can't play the game if you're using a PAL region Wii, because in order to run the NTSC J format disc on a PAL Wii, you need to run it through a program that forces your Wii into NTSC mode, but that means that you can't run it through the English patch program simultaneously, meaning you can either play the game in Japanese or not at all. That is unless you have an NTSC or NTSC J console, it'll work fine on those with the English patch. I resorted to emulating it on my laptop, which I previously thought would be too slow to run it, but as you can see from this footage, it ran and recorded extremely smoothly. So if you're interested in playing the Wii version, I recommend this method. I was even able to set up my Wiimotes so that I could use them to play and they worked mostly fine, apart from a few occasions which I'll mention when they become relevant. But anyway, that's enough nonsense, let's talk about the actual story, which I'll be spoiling in its entirety, so if you'd rather experience it for yourself, then come back to this video after doing so. Fail Frame 4's prologue begins with two girls, Misaki and Madoka, exploring the halls of a decrepit abandoned building. They're here in search of something, something present in memories they no longer recall. Madoka seems pretty apprehensive about this endeavour, but Misaki warns her that they're running out of time. They are two of five girls who were once kidnapped and brought here, another two of whom recently died strange, unnatural deaths. Madoka gets a flash of memories brought back to her by the familiar scent of the building. They're a confusing mess of kidnappings and ritualistic imagery, and once they pass, she realises Misaki is nowhere to be seen. This is where you gain control for the first time, and immediately I felt like the transition of the control scheme from the previous games was done very smoothly and it worked well with this new third person perspective. I've seen people give out about how slow the characters are in this game, but that didn't bother me. If anything, I felt like the characters' pace matched the environments they're running through quite well. It'd do the game's beautifully detailed halls and rooms a complete disservice if you were just sprinting through them constantly, unable to appreciate the gruesome details included in every square inch of the environment. The relatively slow pace also works well with the combat, since you're never able to put too much distance between you and your foe. 
making things a lot more intense. Anyway, you cautiously set off to find Misaki, traversing some seriously sinister hallways on your journey. You catch a glimpse of her going into a room and try to enter after her, but the door has been locked from the other side. Madoka notices a sign beside the door hinting at a possible location of a spare key to unlock it. Doubling back to the hall you started in, you witness the apparition of a nurse ascending the stairs. She leads you to the management office, wherein you find the key to the Dr. Aso museum that Misaki entered. You also get introduced to a couple of cool gameplay mechanics here. The first is how items scattered about the environments will only become visible after you pass over them with your torch. This works well with the new camera and really incentivizes exploration in a way that will have you combing every nook and cranny of each new room you enter, instead of just instantly seeing where items are and making a beeline for them. The other new mechanic is how the character will physically reach for items you find before picking them up. This isn't just some random animation to make the game feel all the more realistic like you'd see in something like Red Dead Redemption 2. This is in order to give opportunities for the items to be stolen away from you by pesky spectral hands. You'll need to pay close attention whenever you pick up an item, although key items and notes are exempt because at any time a ghost could try and snatch the item from you. If you cancel the animation and stop reaching, the ghost hand will miss you and you'll be safe to retrieve the item, although that's difficult to do. As you begin to head back to Misaki, an ear-piercing song begins blaring on the Tannoy system. The tune is grainy, distorted, and hurts to listen to, yet Madoka seems to recognize it, unwillingly. Spurred by the increased desire to get the fuck out of there, you sprint back to the museum and unlock it, only to be distracted by an ominous figure lurking in the shadows down the hall. She gazes out at the moonlight filtering in through the window before turning towards Madoka. A second after her face becomes visible, it warps into a nightmarish miasma which terrifies Madoka and she hurries through the door. Aso's museum is a small room, the most important of which being a camera obscura. As Madoka aims it around the room, she's jump scared by the ghost from the hall. This is the first combat encounter and it's as easy as you'd expect. I like the camera in this game. The shot power builds up the longer you look at the subject, just like in the first fail frame. This mechanic I think works better than the others because it keeps combat encounters flowing at a good pace. You're always able to get a shot off and do some damage instead of having to wait around for a specific moment, which slows down fights considerably like in Fatal Frame 2 and some of 3. Anyway, after defeating the ghost you try opening the other door that Miseki might have gone through, but it's locked. Upon trying to exit the only other door in the room, Madoka is surrounded by several ghosts and seemingly faints. Chapter 1 introduces us to another protagonist, Ruka. She opens with a nice existentialist quote about how forgotten things cease to have ever existed. Maybe she's read 1984. We see her trying to play a melody on a piano while explaining that she, much like the other four girls who were kidnapped, has lost her memories from before that event. Memories of the island she lived on, the house she grew up in, even the image of her father's face, all lost to the trauma of whatever happened on that day they were taken. The only thing she faintly remembers is the melody she's playing. Her face begins to warp into memories of a ritual she took part in as the music becomes more frantic and unstable. She eventually snaps out of this and wakes up on a boat headed towards the place where her forgotten memories lie in wait, Rogetsu Island. As she stands before the elaborate entrance to Rogetsu Hall, she recalls her dying mother warning her to stay away from that place. Yet she boldly walks in, determined to reclaim her lost memories and find out what happened when they were kidnapped here 10 years ago. You gain control of Ruka in the foyer and are greeted by a rotting Tory gate at the base of a staircase. The walls and furniture are aged by time and the air that fills the spaces between is stagnant and suffocating, like an underwater brine pool. At the top of the steps you find a note attached to the gate blocking access to the second floor. This note is from Madoka and it details her unease about her and Misaki's journey here. The note hints that Misaki may have been drawn here for a particular reason or by some kind of force. While descending the steps, you catch a glimpse of Madoka and follow her to Dr. Aso's museum, yet she's nowhere to be seen when you enter. You pick up the camera obscura she used and take a photo of a writhing force that blocks the other door in the room. It leads you to a large food hall where you'll find a key for a room under the staircase as well as another note written by Madoka. It implies that she's losing her memories and the notes she writes are her way of reminding herself. I love this explanation for why you're finding notes around the place as it perfectly works within the narrative. Usually it's kind of odd to find notes left by people in games because it doesn't make sense for them to have written them but here it's integrated so well and I just had to mention it so more people could appreciate it. 
You find the set of masks that appeared in the photo here, but one is missing. It seems it was stolen by a boy whose spirit leads you past the barrier upstairs, which you can now unlock from the storeroom below. His room is at the end of the patient wing, and on the way there you find another of Madika's notes. This one is more fragmented than the rest, and it seems she's becoming more disturbed, writing about how she doesn't recognise her own face. The boy's room is cluttered with junk that seems to have been collected from all around Rogetsu Hall. After some searching, you're startled by what I'd like to assume is a Juan Toshio reference and do battle with the boy. After defeating him, you retrieve the mask and return it to its brethren. This unlocks the door in Aso's museum, inside which is a library and Madoka, whom you find standing in the corner Blair Witch style, croaking like Kayako. I'm absolutely loving all these horror film references, even if they're not intentional. You approach Madoka, but discover that she's, well, a ghost. A ghost with a distorted face to be exact. You do battle with your unfortunate childhood friend and put her out of her misery. After which, Ruka looks at herself in the mirror and sees the reflection of her face contort just like Madoka's did. It seems Ruka doesn't have long before she ends up like her friend. Chapter 2 brings us back to when Misaki and Madoka entered the building, but this time we see the events from Misaki's perspective. She has a flashback of witnessing her face distort and a shadowy figure of a girl in black beckons her to the island. It's clear that this mysterious figure is the driving force behind her desire to come here. We then see Misaki approach that girl in black on the stairs and have another brief flashback of their time together as children. She comes to in a dark room with nothing but a camera obscura as company. Immediately after gaining control of her, you're lured to the office by a radio transmission from Madoka in room 203 pleading for you to return. Apparently Madoka was actually the patient of room 203 as a child, but what she was being treated for isn't clear yet. A note left by one of the nurses clues you into a game the children would play where they hid the password for the door to the second floor ward. The door is locked, so you'll need to play their game. The children's puzzle is solved pretty easily, which makes sense because they're children after all. I like its inclusion though, it's a lot better than just another photo puzzle. Upon reaching Madoka's room, you find it locked and that infernal music begins playing on the speakers again. This seems to draw several patients out of their rooms and you do battle with them. I really enjoyed this fight as both ghosts were pretty aggressive. So aggressive in fact that I got startled and tried to escape the encounter altogether. Returning to Madoka's room, you photograph the blocked door and go to the mirror Ruka looked into in the last chapter. Once there, you do battle with another patient and retrieve the room 203 key as well as a fragment of an old mask. Upon entering Madoka's room, you're bombarded by disturbing ghostly moans and whispers all around you. You find a note written by her as a child, mentioning a menacing girl called Ayako, who you've been seeing visions of around the halls. There's a mirror covered with a cloth and if you attempt to remove it, this will happen. which is absolutely terrifying. And in the next room, you'll find Madoka sitting on the bed, but as you reach out your hand to her, she disappears, leaving behind a note from a nurse. It mentions how Ayako cut the head off Madoka's canary. Clearly this girl has issues and it seems like she's been targeting Madoka in particular. With nothing left to do in the room, you leave and see the nurse calling after Ayako. By following her, you'll witness a vision of Ayako dragging the nurse by her hair towards her room. Inside, you find wooden limbs strung from the ceiling, a rotating lamp that casts a disorienting vortex of shapes onto the walls and constant maniacal laughter and whispers echoing through the room. This is by far the most obviously messed up place in the game, and just standing in here will gradually make you more and more anxious. Ayako attacks and you fight her. Something I'm not fond of here is that you'll actually take damage from the unavoidable attacks in the cutscene. It's not much damage, but it was enough to kill me the first time around because I wasn't expecting to be ambushed like that. Lesson learned, I guess. After defeating Ayako, Misaki is approached by the girl in black again and has a flashback of the girl comforting her as children. The chapter ends, leaving you questioning the girl's identity, just like Misaki. Chapter 3 introduces us to a new character, a detective named Choshiro, who we see being asked by Ruka's mother to save her from the island before waking up outside Rogetsu Hospital building. As he sits up, he spots a man called Yohaibara entering the building ahead of him. This isn't the first time Cho has been to the island, as he was the one who rescued the five kidnapped girls from here ten years ago. This explains how he knows Ruka's mother and why she might rely on him again to help her daughter. Before following Yo into the hospital, you'll notice a faint crying sound coming from the well beside you. This was really disturbing to me and it did a great job of establishing the mood for the rest of the chapter. 
Inside the hospital entrance, you're launched straight into a fight against a patient spirit, but instead of a camera obscura, you'll be using a spirit stone flashlight given to Cho by Ruka's mother. The flashlight works similarly to the cameras, but instead of requiring film, it uses a charging system. You're also able to fire off shots a lot quicker, so fights are often quite fast and intense. To balance the overpowered nature of the flashlight, the ghosts are a lot more aggressive and don't get stunned by shots as much as with the other characters. It's a good system and it distinguishes him from the other characters with a mix up of gameplay. Upstairs you'll make your way through a series of rooms, battling ghosts and catching glimpses of Director Haibara's assistant, Shoji Katagiri, as you go. He drops the key for the surgery section of the hospital, so you head there. This area is completely different to the rest of the hospital. It instantly feels much more sinister thanks to the rusted surgical equipment and unidentifiable stains decorating every room. This more than any other place thus far, except for maybe Ayaka's room, makes you feel like you really shouldn't be here. And I love that. You continue to follow Katakiri's apparition until he does this really lame alien-esque jump scare. After defeating him in battle, he drops a note sending for help after discovering that the faint cries heard from the well were actually the children that were recently kidnapped. Back in the waiting room, you catch a glimpse of Yo descending in the elevator, which is still inaccessible to you. The assistant continues to lead you through the other side of the building to Director Haibara's office. There's a puzzle here involving a number pad that had me so confused that I resorted to looking up the solution on the internet, even after which I still don't understand how to solve it. You then gain access to a secret passage behind a shelving unit and discover a hidden treatment room filled with apparatus that looks like it'll do more damage than good to a patient. Beyond this room is another passage which leads to the basement where the elevator led. Choshiro has a flashback of when he found the children. Their vacant expressions look back at him and Ruka being just conscious enough to mention something called the ceremony of passage. The chapter ends without Cho finding Ruka. And I really enjoyed this chapter. The switch up in combat makes the gameplay fun in a different way to usual and the hospital environments were such a breath of fresh air for the series. Most of the time in Fatal Frame games you're either exploring old mansions or even older cave systems so this new kind of location felt extremely distinct and memorable. The game has impressed me so far, it really has. So, I think it's a good time to pause the plot progression to explain a few elements of the story that I've glossed over for the sake of pacing. I'll do a couple more of these throughout the video just to make sure everybody understands the story and all its complexities, but I'll only be revealing as much as the game has each time. So, Rogetsu Island has a rich ritualistic history dating back many generations. It used to be closed off to the outside world, but in recent times has opened its gates to tourists who wish to witness its traditions. The main ritual they perform is known as the Kagura ritual, which is only done during a lunar eclipse. Its purpose is to send the souls that remain on the island to the afterlife, which the moon is a gateway to. On Rogetsu Island, the moon is considered a religious object, and when it is eclipsed, memory, personality, and the soul are revealed. In the Kagura ritual, masks are worn in order to allow the wearer to make contact with the world of the dead. The main shrine maiden called the Utsuwa wears a special mask called the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse and functions as a vessel for the spirits of the departed to be held in during the ritual. She is accompanied by five younger shrine maidens called Kanade, who play a tune for the Utsuwa to dance and lose herself to. The dance lasts the whole night and observers wear masks and hold candles. A disaster called The Day Without Suffering took place on two occasions, one on an unknown date many years ago during a ceremony of passage, which is the original form of the Kagura ritual before it was adapted to be more tourist friendly. The other day without suffering occurred two years after the ritual ten years ago. On the second occasion, most of the island's population were killed and their bodies were found in a horrific state, covering their faces with their hands. The remaining islanders seemingly disappeared without a trace. In an attempt to cure the island of its curse, five girls were kidnapped and forced to take part in a ritual. Yet again, something went wrong which led to another disaster. Since then, nobody has been able to perform the ritual, so the curse remains. The curse in question is known as Luna Sedata Syndrome, or at least that's the translation in the English patch. The severity of the curse varies with the stages of the moon. When the moon is full, patients are calmer, while during an eclipse, the patients become restless and afraid. LSS manifests in several different stages. Budding and breaking are when the afflicted become drawn to the moon and feel at ease when basking in its light, resulting in them often sleepwalking to find it. Their memories also begin to gradually fade and they have trouble recognising their own face in reflections. Resonance is when the afflicted will progress to the final stage if they witness another person in that state. 
The final stage of the curse, blooming, is when the identity of the afflicted is so confused that their face blooms into a horrific miasma. We've seen many examples of this so far, from the patients in the hospital and Madoka, to the brief prophetic visions Misaki and Ruka had which indicated that they don't have much time left. Some of those afflicted choose to end their own life before letting the curse take them. Floors 2, 3 and 4 of Rogetsu Hall are used to house patients affected by LSS, higher floors containing patients of worse condition. None of the residents understand how this curse works, but one man took it upon himself to discover why, that being Director Haibara. Director Shigeto Haibara is a descendant of spiritual healers on Rogetsu and is the leading researcher on Luna Sedata Syndrome. He built Rogetsu Hall as a way to treat the sickness. His approach to which is unique and many of his treatments are unprecedented in the world of medical science. One such method is music therapy, which consists of playing a lunar melody to hopefully calm or heal the patients. This is what was heard while playing on the speakers while playing as Madoka. One of his more radical treatments is brain surgery, which mostly had positive results except for an unfortunate fatality. The surgery was done by adding or removing various stimuli to the human brain. It's clear that Hybara is desperate to cure the disease by any means possible, but whether the ends justify his means is uncertain. Now with that knowledge, let's continue. Chapter 4 returns to Ruka, who immediately begins to relive traumatic memories after hearing the lunar melody play over the intercom. Upon leaving the room, you begin to follow the nurse back to the management office. On the way there, the lunar melody begins to play again. You turn off the music in the office and find a note detailing the mostly negative effects it had on patients. It's such an ear-aching and unnerving sound, no wonder they didn't find it very therapeutic. A message comes through calling you to Ayako's room, so you head there, reluctantly. Inside you do battle with her and find a note that mentions how much of a sadistic evil brat she is, which isn't surprising at all. The battle is quite tough as she's very aggressive and evasive enough that you'll have trouble keeping track of her. That coupled with the hanging doll limbs that constantly get in your way makes it quite challenging, but in a good way. Once she's defeated, you gain access to another room past hers, which, well, you know I think I'll just let this one speak for itself. Trust me, with a good pair of headphones, that was so unsettling that I could not concentrate on reading the note at all. It's amazingly intense, yet so simply done. In here you find a piece of sheet music and since we already know Ruka can play the piano, we know to head straight to the dining hall where there's one waiting. Now this is the first of several instances in the game where you'll need to play a piece of music and for some reason the emulator wouldn't register my Wiimote's motion so I had to spend about 25 minutes figuring out a way around this. It resulted in me having to use mouse and keyboard each time so that's the reason you'll see a cursor on the screen during these moments. Anyway, playing the melody on the sheet music is kind of tough, even with the mouse, as you need to match the timing of the tune to play it properly, which gets more difficult each time. The melody returns some memories to Ruka and she sees flashes of her time here as a child when she would frequently ride the elevator. Which makes sense, I guess, since I doubt there's much else for a child to do in a mental hospital. Upon reaching said elevator, a woman dressed in black exits, pushing an identical woman in a wheelchair. The elevator has no power, so you need to head to the breaker room in the basement to restore it. It seems the door leading down there is locked, so you follow the woman outside to the courtyard where you discover that the one in the wheelchair is actually a doll version of the other. You fight them both in an honestly really fun battle. They both have very different fighting styles. Kagari, the real woman, will slide and teleport around while Watashi, her doll, will stumble towards you relentlessly, meaning you'll need to keep moving at all times lest you get caught between them. The sound design in this fight is also incredible. One of them speaks with a violent graveliness while the other moans in a more soft, sorrowful way. It's fucking great. After the fight, as Ruka gathers herself, a woman with a blooming face begins to ascend the steps leading to the courtyard from the basement below. A collection of spectral faces writhe around her as she approaches you. This is clearly the antagonist of the game, and in classic fail frame style, it's time to run away immediately. Well, as long as your Wiimote doesn't disconnect at least. It's pretty easy to escape her though, and after returning to the safety of inside the haunted mental hospital, you can make your way down to the basement through the door that unlocks with the key retrieved from Kagari and Watashi. You solve the power issue and follow a ghost through another door. He leads you to the Morning Shrine, a place only the purified or whom the moon shines upon can enter. 
The talisman is stuck to the claustrophobic walls, fail in stopping them from falling apart, and it sounds like your eardrums are rattling from some paranormal pressure in here. The way forward is shut, and you discover the way back is also now shut, at least until you defeat the spirit blocking it. You return to the elevator with the blooming woman hot on your tail, and once inside you can ascend to the third floor. This floor, as you may recall, houses patients more heavily afflicted by Luna Sedata syndrome, so I was pretty excited to see what they had in store for me. You begin to make your way through the ward, and soon find a note that indicates that Ruka and Misaki were also patients here. You follow the nurse and come across a familiar scene to Ruka. She stops outside the door to her room, 308. This chapter was pretty great. I love how all the floors get progressively more potentially dangerous, because that's where the more severe patients dwell. It builds suspense really well and gives the game a natural way to physically represent progression, both of narrative and mechanical difficulty. You know you'll have to go to the fourth floor eventually, and the hints at what awaits you there make you dread each step towards it. Chapter 5 brings us back to Misaki, who continues her search for Madoka and the identity of the girl in black. As you try to leave Ayako's room, the girl in black will lure you back into that even spookier room on the far side. In there, you find a note from Ayako, pleading for help from her mother and Yo Haibara. It seems there is a relationship between Ayako and the Haibara, since we saw in a previous chapter that director Haibara referred her to the hospital himself, requesting special treatment. That may explain why the staff seem a bit more lenient with her cruel, violent ways. A note written by Yo can be found in the room past this, which mentions some of the other girls. Apparently Ayako was fond of Madoka, in a weird, twisted way, which is why she tormented her more than the others. Ayako also said she doesn't like Misaki or her friend dressed in black. In addition to that note, you also find a film reel, which is cool. With this, you can head down to the dining hall to view it on the projector. I have to point out that as you approach the hall door, it becomes surrounded by the sound of ghostly whispering and it's incredibly eerie. I really didn't want to enter the room, not knowing if I'd encounter whatever the source of these whispers were. The film shows footage of the Kagura dance going wrong, but what we see are Misaki's memories of the moment. We see her being led away from the festival by some man before the mask breaks off the face of the Utsuwa to reveal a blooming visage. Suddenly, Madoka is standing in front of the projection screen, her features obscured by the flashing images. She lunges at Misaki and disappears from sight before reappearing and fighting you. After she's defeated, she drops a letter to Misaki, talking about her jealousy of Misaki and the girl in Black's close relationship. She'd be happy if Misaki never remembered her, but she knew the day would eventually come. It's pretty sad to see Madoka go out like this, as she was so hesitant to come here to begin with. Through her notes we see her deteriorate until she's nothing but a tragic, displaced spirit. Leaving the dining hall, you witness the girl in black standing in the elevator and follow her to the third floor which has since been unlocked by Ruka, who we unfortunately haven't run into yet. Some players believe this is due to the two characters existing in separate dimensions on the island, but I think it's just that they coincidentally keep missing each other. Misaki's room is locked with a spirit barrier, and on the journey to dispel it, you begin seeing visions of the young girls playing in the halls. They lead you to one of the more unusual rooms in the game, for sure. It's like it was designed by someone obsessed with the music video for Helena by My Chemical Romance. This is Kagari Sendo's room, the woman we saw earlier pushing the wheelchair. It seems she lost her sister at some point and created the doll in her likeness. She became so obsessed with the doll that upon dying, the doll's spirit also became a ghost. Or something like that anyway. This is why the doll is called Watashi, meaning I in Japanese. The coffin in the centre of the room opens, and Kagari emerges to fight you. Without the help of Watashi, she's not as much of a threat, but the setting of this fight still makes it really cool. After defeating her, you find a note in her casket which reveals that she was the reason her twin died. With that settled, you can return to Misaki's room, which is now open. Inside you find a note, mentioning that Misaki's condition was directly tied to that of the patient in room 412, and also refers to someone called Mia. Could this be the girl in black? Immediately after reading this, she is attacked by a group of doctors, intent on doing some unorthodox procedure on her. However, this time she has her trusty camera obscura, so they don't succeed. After solving a quick puzzle, you acquire a key for the elevator, which allows you to go to the fourth floor, and also a photo of Misaki and a faceless woman. She has a vision of entering the woman's room, and seeing her sitting on her bed holding something with a loving expression on her face. Whoever she is, she may hold the answers to all of Misaki's questions. We catch up with Ruka at the start of chapter 6, as she stands outside her room, hesitant to twist the doorknob and reveal whatever secrets lie within. Of course, when you try to enter, it's blocked by a spirit barrier, so off you go to remove it. 
you follow a ghost into a nearby room, with many paintings decorating its walls. After retrieving Ruka's room key, you're forced to pass through the eccentric Magaki's room, which is filthy with old paint and discarded works of art. On the floor lies his magnum opus, brought to him by visions he experienced in place of his lost memories. In Ruka's room, you find a tape that hints at masks giving people different personalities. Her father was seemingly one of those to fall victim to this. You then leave to head to Misaki's room to retrieve a gear for Ruka's music box. The gear puzzle is kind of tricky, but it's very satisfying to solve. When all the gears are connected, they play a beautiful, pure melody that you then must replicate on the piano. It's a longer version of the tune you played earlier. Once you successfully play the piece, Ruka gets visions of practicing the piano with her mother by her side and is then transported to Ruka's childhood home. To establish that this is some sort of vision Ruka's experiencing, this place is sapped of all colour and life, resulting in this cold green monotone look that is completely different to the rest of the game. You find notes written by her mother, Sayaka, detailing Ruka's worsening condition and her husband, Soya's descent into, not madness, but some other state of being. Her notes are quite poetic and eloquently written, yet they're used to describe the growing troubles within the family. Downstairs you find a photo of her father and Ruka gets a flashback of a time she went to visit him in his workshop but it cuts off before she saw his face. After this you're back in room 308 where you find scraps of Ruka's diary under the bed. Her heartbreaking entry the day before the festival tells of her frustration with the disease that is robbing her of the memories of her loved ones. Her father in particular, or at least who he used to be. She also finds a small mask. A vision shows it being placed on her by a man accompanied by a woman named Sakuya who is dressed as an Utsua. After this, you head to the nearby nurse's office and find another one of Sayaka's notes. She regrets admitting Ruka to Haibara's hospital after the girls were kidnapped and thinks it's better Ruka never remembers what happened to her down there if all it'll cause is more heartbreak. But now it's time to head to the place Ruka was found, so you head to the first floor where you find a spirit barrier blocking the passage to the hospital section of the building. While on the journey to remove it, you find a note referring to the dreaded patient on the fourth floor. Apparently she was suspended in a state of neither life nor death, and if she woke up, the whole world would collapse. At least according to a mentally deteriorating duty nurse, so who knows how credible a report it is. Anyway, now that the superior barrier is released, you can make your way to the elevator in the hospital, which descends to the tunnels below. Once there, Ruka returns to the cabin she was found in for the first time in 10 years. Memories rush back to her and she feels a pleasant familiarity in that place. She feels like she's melting into a place she belongs and the chapter ends. This was a really enjoyable chapter. I'd been extremely engaged with the story thus far, so each new piece of information that got revealed was extremely satisfying. The mysteries surrounding this island are getting unveiled at such a tantalizing pace that I found it very difficult to stop playing. Chapter seven then switches over to Choshiro, who is still in the cave after failing to find Ruka. You return to the floor above and follow a nurse into a room cramped with patient beds. A note with a key hints at some answers to the cause of some deaths that are held in some documents meant for the incinerator. You also find a note talking about a nurse called Tono, who performed as the Utsuwa in the Kagura dance before dying mid-performance. The cause of the death was unknown and the condition of her face couldn't be determined. What's most unusual about this though is that it means that there was possibly another ritual taking place simultaneously, as we also find out that the shrine maidens performing the Kagura dance all died on stage. Yet, if the five kidnapped girls took part in that ritual, they wouldn't be alive today. Well, mostly. You leave here and continue to follow the nurse down the hall. In order to leave this basement, you need to remove another spirit barrier, so you set off down a different path which leads to one of the more disturbing areas in the game. A corridor surrounds the room entirely, making it seem more like a prisoner's cell than anything else. Inside it hangs a body upside down, wrapped in cloth, forgotten. After inspecting it from the small shutter, you're then attacked by the spirit that once inhabited that unfortunate corpse. She's one of the more interesting ghosts in the game, as she crawls towards you on the ceiling and will occasionally hang down to attack you. Once she's dispatched, you restore power to the gate and head back. In the hall above, there's a note that talks about the children that will be kidnapped for the ritual. An interesting thing to mention here is that Marie and Tomoe didn't live at the hospital. Could this be why they died before the others? It also mentions that the Kanade that were chosen for the Kagura ritual weren't good enough to perform it effectively, since they weren't pure or sensitive enough. 
Inside Director Hybara's office is a note from Ruka's father, thanking Hybara for his help with making the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse by giving him access to previously lost documents on the Ceremony of Passage. Another note written by Hybara mentions that they are doing a proper Ceremony of Passage instead of the bastardized Kagura dance version. He has the completed true Mask of Lunar Eclipse made by Soya. The five kidnapped girls will act as Kanade and the Utsua will be his daughter Sakuya, who also suffers greatly from LSS. All they need to do is wait until the day of the eclipse to perform it and rid the island of the Lunar Sadata curse. So after this info dump you make your way to a literal dump out the back of the surgical wing. Inside the rusted incinerators you find a stack of letters 27 pages long sent to Joshiro by Atakashi Aiba. Luckily for you, the only thing in there that I haven't already mentioned was the existence of a mysterious black mask. After all that reading, you follow the nurse to the end of a long path lined with bamboo, lanterns and small Tory gates. It ends at a pile of gravestones, which retrospectively is quite dark considering we're behind the surgical wing. At the back of this is a large grave with a note written by Tsubaki Tono, the woman who died in the Kagura dance and also the nurse who led you here. The note conveys her as a kind, well-meaning young woman who only took part in the ritual to show gratitude to the islanders. It's a really sad read actually, Christ. She also gives you a reel of film, which when played in Rogetsu Hall shows the death of Tono and the Five Kanade. A tape you find behind the projector screen reveals the name of the patient on the fourth floor, Sakuya Haibara, the same woman who took part in the secret ritual and also the woman that had a loving friendly connection with Misaki. There was also mention of the patient Magaki in the tape so you head to his room next. Well no, we'll make a stop in Ruka's room first and get attacked by that pesky doctor again, who drops a small key when defeated. As soon as you enter Magaki's room you're attacked by him. He's one of the cooler fights in the game as he'll do things like throw paint in your eye to partially blind you. It's really cool. Once he's defeated you check out the painting on his floor. Cho has a flashback of his search for Haibara years ago when he encounters the blooming Sakuya in the courtyard, after which he questions why Yo would return to the island when it's completely deserted. And that's the end of the chapter. It's a really dense one in terms of lore and reveals so I hope I did a good job of explaining it. And speaking of explaining things, it's time for another recap segment. Some interesting information about the girls is revealed. Ruka is a member of the renowned Yomotsuki household, the family that has made masks for the island's rituals for generations. Misaki is a member of the also renowned Aso household and relative to Dr. Kunihiko Aso, which is pretty cool. She's made to stay away from Sakuya Haibara, the patient on the fourth floor, because they are both very psychically sensitive and influence one another's conditions, although this doesn't stop them from forming a close relationship. The reason Ayako dislikes Misaki is because she doesn't understand how she knows things. This could either be due to her having some psychic ability or because she learns things from talking to Ayako's mother, Sakuya. Madoka was also tormented by Ayako as a child, but unlike Misaki, Ayako wasn't intimidated by her so she got Ayako's full force of abuse. The evidence of these personalities is still clear from the opening moments of the game, with Misaki being quite strong headed and Madoka being very timid in comparison. So it seems that music and memory are closely linked and that listening to music can help people regain certain memories, as if with the music they can connect with their inner selves. This can be seen on several occasions, when the lunar melody is played on the speakers and the girls start having their flashbacks, and when Ruka plays the piano and is transported into a memory realm of her childhood home. There are musical traditions on the island as well, referred to as the melodies of the moon, but they seem to be mostly forgotten. The ceremony of passage seems to be the cause of the days without suffering when performed incorrectly. It must be done in order to transport the souls on the island to the other world and stop the spread of Luna Sedata syndrome if it's overdue. Usage of masks on the island has long since been taboo as they were most likely blamed for the past tragedy. This is with regards to the masks worn in the Kagura dance ritual. The spectators can wear masks without harm. We see in the ritual held by director Haibara and co that they do in fact wear masks with no regard for breaking taboo. According to Soya, the first day without suffering was caused because the mask created for the ritual by Soya's ancestor Soetsu was incomplete. The reason the mask needs to be completed is because the souls of the dead flow into the Utsuwa during the ritual and she releases them, guiding them to the other world. If this isn't done properly, we get a day without suffering situation. Regarding masks, when a person who is budding comes in contact with a blooming person and dies, their face must be cut off and destroyed so that they too don't start blooming. A mask resembling the person's face is then placed instead. We see possible instances of this with Tsubaki Tono's corpse during Cho's chapter. The mask replaces the dead face, becoming the dead face. The dead, 
then becomes the mask. This may explain why some people who wear masks suddenly adopt new personality traits, being that the spirit that resides within the mask influences their mind. There, I hope I've cleared up some questions you have. I know it's getting a lot more confusing, so I'm doing my best to make sense of it all, both for you and me. Hopefully it's working. <laughs> anyway, back to the game. Chapter 8 begins with the memory of Misaki playfully entering Sakia's room and is greeted with a smile as she sits on her bed, holding something. The girl in black begins leading you through the halls towards the elevator, where you use the key and finally ascend to the fourth floor. Once there, you find a note in the nurse's office that mentions Misaki carrying around a doll given to her by Sakuya. This is probably what we saw her holding in the cutscene. You solve an extremely pointless control panel puzzle and unlock the isolation ward. As you attempt to enter, a nurse will open the shutter and glare at you with eyes that warn against proceeding. Yet, you can just open the door right after this and continue fine. While following a vision of a younger Misaki down the hall, you find some really disturbing notes detailing the nurse's growing troubles while tending to Sakya, after reading which you'll be attacked by said nurse and are forced to do battle. Her attacks are very aggressive and she'll rush at you really quickly so you need to have quick reactions to deal with her. It's a pretty good fight although she can spend too much time in the walls where you can't get her. Outside Sakya's room, you find a note written by Haibara's assistant Katagiri that says Sakya uses dolls to temporarily maintain her state of being. She holds them, transforming them into spiritual vessels that reflect her inner self. As Misaki opens the door, we see memories of her witnessing Sakya's condition deteriorate. Inside the room, you find some of Sakya's diaries, which indicate she was fully aware of what was happening and what would happen to her, that her soul would eventually collapse under the pressure of being the Utsuwa, which she apparently didn't enjoy. She didn't want to bear the burden, to allow the souls of the dead to eat away at something she refers to as her sound. You also find a note by Misaki here, which talks a lot about how comforting Mia was to her. She would console her after being scolded and would make her feel better. And when Misaki would get all LSS confused, she'd reassure her that Misaki is Misaki. In this room, you also solve a tile sliding puzzle, which honestly took me over 20 minutes to solve, but man was it satisfying when I finally did. I usually hate these puzzles, but I couldn't look up the solution online, so I just had to power through it. Solving this rewards you with Sakuya's final note. In it she says that people's souls are a mass of sound, but so many sounds are echoing that she cannot hear her own. You then approach the girl in black by the bed and get sudden flashes of the route to the basement. Everything fades to black and somehow Misaki is on the hospital roof? Before you have time to wonder how you got here, you witness director Haibara's wife jump off the roof, committing suicide. She left a note bidding farewell to her beloved family, regretting that she's leaving them behind but must so she doesn't suffer from LSS anymore. Returning inside, you traverse a series of cramped rooms and halls until you find part of an unsent letter, assumedly from Takashi Aiba, which talks further about his research into the island. Apparently, masks were made in order to store memories and affect the mind of the wearer, either in a literal or figurative sense. You make your way underground, following the girl in black, and upon reading a note on an altar, Misaki remembers that on the day of the ritual she left something dear to her behind. After the flashback, she notices the girl beside her. She approaches, but everything goes black. Once she comes to, she's in a different place again, this time a large cave passage. You follow the girl in black again to the centre of a huge cavern. Here, Misaki remembers Yo placing a mask on her before the ritual, and then watching as her precious friend Sakuya succumbs to the horrors of a failed ceremony of passage. She then comes to realise Sakuya is right in front of her, but she's not the same as she once was. You then fight Sakuya in a pretty decent fight. She moves around a lot so it's impossible to keep track of her unless you keep your distance. She also swoops down often and grabs you, doing a lot of damage. Thankfully though, she's pretty weak, but I barely made it out of this fight alive. It was great. After defeating her, Sakuya transforms into the girl in black, who approaches a doll in a black dress lying on the ground. Misaki then remembers the thing she forgot was that doll, and that her doll is called Mia, and that the girl in black is the spiritual manifestation of Mia. The doll was given life through Misaki and Sakya's strong friendship, with a little help from their combined psychic abilities too, I guess. The manifestation of Sakya embraces Misaki as she weeps into the doll. It's a loving moment that, oh, wait, no, she's evil. Misaki collapses and the doors close behind her. Chapter 9 returns us to Ruka, who is still in the cave where we left her. She receives a piece of the mask from a vision or something of Choshiro before he fades into the shadows. A vision of Yo Haibara dragging child Ruka leads you deeper into the cave system. 
Ruka squeezes through a crawl space that was previously inaccessible to the big manly Cho and proceeds through a really cool series of ancient tunnels. Down here you get visions of Sakia's blooming rampage and also encounter some of her victims in their final resting places, if you could even call it rest. You continue to descend through the bowels of the island, fighting off Sakia's victims and fleeing from her when she occasionally manifests. Also, this may have just been a slight bug, but at one point I encountered a ghost who stood silently in my path, completely visible, not trying to hide and pounce at me or anything. It may not have been intentional, but it was incredibly intimidating. Shortly after this, Sakia will ambush you again from an adjoining corridor, but as soon as you escape her, I recommend returning to where she blocked you from entering and retrieving the zero lens. You're welcome. As you begin to ascend steps, you find a note which provides a lot of insight into the island's culture. Firstly, Luna Sedata Syndrome seems to surface around the time of a lunar eclipse, regardless of whether the ritual was performed correctly last time or not, so I was incorrect in my previous theory. Glad I found this note. It also expands upon how souls are considered sound, saying that that sound is the lunar melody, which is the music that was played throughout Rogetsu Hall. Each person's lunar melody differs from the other and how it sounds depends on the person's mental state. LSS disrupts this sound and may eventually destroy it. At the end of the tunnel system, you find yourself ascending a staircase into a new building. As you climb, a strange mechanical noise builds in volume and intensity. It seems like something out of Sound Hill 3 and made me quite anxious as I got closer to it. Through a door at the top is where you finally find the stage for the Kagura dance. It's surrounded on all sides by rows of long since emptied seats and as you make your way to the centre where the moonlight pours in, Ruka has another vision. It shows the ritual that was performed 10 years ago, where the Utsua and five Kanade all died. Ruka then watches as the Utsua rises from the ground like an activated trap. She then attacks you with the help of all five Kanade. This fight is amazing and it combines all my favourite combat elements into one. It has a main enemy that is evasive and hard hitting when they land an attack. Multiple enemies that work together to not only disorient you, but to constantly flank you and keep you moving around, lest you get cornered. It also has great narrative relevance, as these six characters have been seen from the very start and even though we don't know much about the Kanade, we've built up an emotional connection to the Utsua, played by the gentle innocent nurse Tubaki Tono. It's by far the best fight in the game, and I actually felt kind of sad when I defeated them, because I just wanted to continue fighting them. Nevertheless, once they're all beaten, Ruka regains her memory of being taken from the Kagura ritual and being brought underground to the site of the Ceremony of Passage, where she joins the other four girls and Sakya, who wears the black mask, which we now see was the mask of the lunar eclipse. You enter a different door outside the stage that grants access to the other side of the building. You'll witness a quick vision of Yo descending some stairs, and if you follow him you'll find the anteroom, which is notable for the gigantic mask at its centre which is definitely one of the coolest visuals in the game. Returning upstairs, you'll follow a vision of Soya through a filthy corridor with peeling rotten walls until you reach an altar room where you find a particularly disgusting note. It shares the details of how the Utsuwa's mask is made. The horrific truth is that it's made from the removed face of a person who has budded. In the next room is Soya's workshop, but when you try to enter, it's locked by a powerful force. Continuing down the hall, you arrive at the entrance to Ruka's childhood home. In chapter 10 we catch up with Choshiro, who is still in Magaki's room. Taking a photo of his Sakuya painting with your flashlight, that'll never not sound weird, will reveal an image of the courtyard. After exiting the room, you follow a vision of Yo to the hallway of paintings and get a key to the basement under the courtyard. As you turn to leave, you discover a wheelchair has been placed behind you while you weren't looking. As you walk past it, Kagari appears and the two of you just kind of stand there awkwardly for a few seconds. It's weird, but anyway, you fight her and she drops a note detailing her encounter with Sakya on her blooming rampage. You then make your way to the courtyard and Cho has a vision of his past when he himself encountered Sakuya. Then, with perfect timing, Sakuya begins to ascend the steps towards him. You fight her again, but this time it's not so bad because of the flashlight's rapid speed. Pushing on down to the basement, you can now enter that morning shrine that was previously locked. In here, you find what seems to be two jail cells, one of which appears to be where Sakuya was held in a state between life and death after the failed ceremony of passage. Due to her not being fully dead, they couldn't remove her face to stop her from blooming. As you approach her cell, Ruka's mother Sayaka appears behind you and asks Cho to give Ruka a piece of the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse that lies on the bed. This seems to be the piece that we saw him give her in the last chapters, so we can assume that this takes place before then. 
When I left this room, I started to hear the audio from when Sakuya pursues you and the filter was blue, indicating there was something to be found, but I couldn't find it, whatever it was. I think the room was bugged, so I'm sorry if I missed something important here. Anyway, you follow a vision of someone, I don't know who because I miss them, down to the tunnels below the hospital and do battle with director Haibara, who you encounter as he transports one of the girls. It's a fairly tough fight as he likes to teleport around and send projectiles at you from within walls, but once he's defeated, Cho will give the piece of the mask to an apparition or something of Ruka as a child. This seems to be his point of view of the exchange we saw earlier, so I guess there's some kind of weird time thing going on after all. He then takes off running after Yo, who does a terrible job of sneaking up behind him. The chase continues to the rooftop, where Cho finally confronts him, only to be stabbed in the gut while being taunted by his longtime foe. Irritated by this, Cho charges Yo, and they both tumble over the railing, coming to a stop on the hard ground several stories below. Cho's body lies there, and his spirit stands beside him. Yo Haibara's body is nowhere to be seen. Sayaka then approaches him, offering a sad yet comforting expression. And that's when Cho realises that he was dead this whole time. The real confrontation with Yo happened eight years ago when he came to the island on his search. He witnessed Sakya in the courtyard just after she awakened and later died, only to have his soul resurrected by Sayaka in order to do one last favour for her. When we see the exchange of the mask between him and Ruka, that's his actual spirit, not some weird time or dimensional vision of him. It's also important to note that the exact spot where we first saw Cho was his final resting place. We just didn't know it yet. Man, that hit me hard. Chapter 11 returns us to Ruka. Soon after gaining control, you'll see Soya quickly move across one of the doorways and lock himself in a room further down the hall. In order to enter, you'll need to remove three mask talismans which are scattered around the house. The first is on the front door, and once it's removed, Sayaka leads you upstairs. As you climb the steps, a lunar melody can be heard being played somewhat poorly on a piano down the hall. Inside the last room is a vision of Sayaka teaching Ruka how to play. You then play the tune again, probably even worse, and hear Ruka's mother tell her there's something she wants to give her when she's good enough to play. Apparently she's good enough now, thanks to us, and Ruka sees flashes of what looks like a mirror hidden somewhere in the house. Before leaving, there's a cute note written by Ruka on the table that should be read by everyone. Down the hall in Sayaka's bedroom, you find a letter she wrote to Soya before they married. It mentions a few things. The first is the Tsukimori song, which I guess we could assume is the melody she taught Ruka. The second is that the duty of the Tsukimori maidens, of which she is one, was to play the lunar melody to protect the islanders. You may recall that Madoka's family name was Tsukimori, which makes her and Ruka related. The third is something called a Gesho machine, which we'll probably find out about later. One thing I loved about this note was how Sayaka said that if she and Soya combined their lunar melody, it would make her the happiest woman in the world. I interpreted this as her wanting to carry his child, which is really fucking romantic, damn. There's a masked talisman in here that you can remove and inside the closet is the Tsukimori mirror, which you place on the stand near the window. A note comes with the mirror that says when the Tsukimori song is forgotten, time stands still. Ruka is the last of the Tsukimori now that her mother and Madoka are dead, and she's only now starting to remember the song, which may explain why several people wrote notes about time seemingly having stopped on the island after the day without suffering. Once the mirror is placed where it belongs, the moonlight is reflected onto the opposite wall, which when photographed reveals an old musical score arranged like a lunar calendar. Now, as far as I'm aware, this doesn't actually do anything, so we'll move on. After returning downstairs, you're attacked by some guy. I'm not sure who this is. I don't think it's Soya, because his room isn't unlocked yet, so I really have no idea who it is. What I do know, however, is that he's probably the toughest fucking enemy in the entire game. His erratic movements and powerful, aggressive attacks are a goddamn nightmare to deal with when combined with this area's layout. There are plenty of walls and wooden beams for him to hide behind. I'm not joking when I say this was the hardest fight in the game. I barely made it out alive. I did enjoy it though. The last mask talisman is in a nearby room, and once it's removed, the guy attacks again. Unfortunately, I didn't make it out of that encounter unscathed, but we'll ignore that. After defeating him, you're clear to enter the room Soya's in. Inside, you find the Lunar Melody sheet music, which looks similar to the projection we saw upstairs. It comes with a note detailing how it was recovered from old documents belonging to the High Barras. You also find a Canada's mask and a decoding table for the sheet music. With your pockets full, you exit the house and follow a Canada back to the ante room where you fight the five Canada again. It's not as fun without the Utsua, but it's still a decent fight. 
After this, you place the Canada mask on the altar and it unlocks a mechanism designed like the lunar calendar. You match the symbols to the decoding table and open up a secret passage behind it. It leads back down to the underground lunar hall where we last saw Misaki, who is nowhere to be found. Only Mia remains lying in the center of the stage. Ruka finds a piece of the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse beside the doll and has a vision of the ceremony of passage being performed. We see Sakuya gradually losing herself to the music and right at the climax, when the moon is fully eclipsed, her mask shatters and she blooms. At the same time, the Kagura ritual is interrupted by the instant deaths of the six performers, caused by the secret ritual directly below. Shigeto and Yo Haibara approach the fallen maidens. Director Haibara blames Soya for not making the mask properly, but still doesn't fully understand why the ritual failed. Sakuya is dragged off to her chamber to be studied, and the children are led to the spot under the well where the moonlight will feed them the spiritual sustenance to heal their souls. As you attempt to leave, Sakuya will ambush you and chase you all the way back upstairs. You follow Soya back to his workshop again and grab another piece of the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse off the altar. You enter the previously locked room and find him toiling away at another mask. He turns around slowly, just like in Ruka's fragmented memories, and reveals his face covered by a horrific leathery mask. He approaches Ruka in the most sinister fucking way and then begins to fight. He's pretty tough, not as tough as the guy from earlier, but he still puts up a good fight with his mask projectiles and hard hitting lunges. Once he's defeated, he'll warn Ruka that the lunar eclipse is starting, before sinking back into the shadows. I found that end to the chapter to be quite impactful. Ruka finally meeting her father again as a ghost and seeing how corrupt he's become is kind of heartbreaking. I would have liked more of a reaction afterwards from her instead of just a fade to black because throughout the entire game one of her main goals was to find something of her father and when she finally does it seems like maybe she would have been better off without having done so. Regardless, it was an amazing chapter and sets up the finale perfectly. Chapter 12 continues with Ruka because... Well, she's the only one left. She looks out towards the eclipsing moon, and the lighthouse begins to beckon her with its warning light. Before you head there though, you can check out Soya's workshop, which is open now since you've defeated him. As you explore the room, your Wiimote will disconnect. Nah, I'm only joking. A note you find explains Dr. Aso's relevance to the story. He was the one who photographed Soyetsu's Mask of the Lunar Eclipse with a camera obscura, which allowed its design to be used as reference by Soya. Without this, Soetsu's design and techniques would have been lost forever. Another note details Soya's confusion as to why the Ceremony of Passage failed, even though he was sure he crafted the perfect mask. An interesting thing here that dictates just how far gone he was is that instead of mentioning his daughter, Ruka, that was negatively affected by the ritual, he just refers to the Kanade as a whole, completely focused on his own failure as a craftsman rather than his failure as a father. Ruka then has a vision of her father retreating to the tunnels on the day without suffering before the altar in front of her slides to the side revealing a secret passage. Inside is a long staircase and as you descend it you witness visions of Sakuya closing in on Soya's hiding place. Eventually you find it and see a vision of him sitting awaiting his inevitable demise. You find his final note in which he reckons the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse wasn't the cause of the failed ritual at all. You then follow Sakuya to the exit which leads to a small beach if you could even call it that. A Tory gate sits just offshore, and Ruka has a vision of many people flocking towards it for safety or comfort, although it was obviously too late. There was no stopping Sakuya. On the other side of the beach is a cave that leads to the lighthouse. Ruka believes that since it's the highest point on the island and closest to the moon, that Sakuya will be there waiting for the impending lunar eclipse. You enter the base of the lighthouse and begin to climb its spiral staircase. As you do, Soya will continue to appear and fight you, trying his best to delay you until the lunar eclipse will be completed and Sakiya's bloom will strengthen, or something. As you ascend the lighthouse, fighting off Ruka's father occasionally, this really strange music will start to play. It loops without end, growing in volume the closer you get to the top. I'm not sure what instrument it is, it sounds like a bagpipe, but its unusual sound creates a really intense atmosphere that makes you feel the weight of the situation. You really begin to sense the finality with every foot you put before you. Once you defeat Soya for the last time, he will drop a note that hints at the ceremony of passage missing something, something that calms the soul. He also drops the final mask of the lunar eclipse, allowing you to reassemble it. When you reach the top of the lighthouse, you find Sayaka waiting there to remind Ruka of the importance of the Tsukimori song, otherwise known as the lunar melody. This song has the power to soothe those affected by Luna Sedata Syndrome and return souls to the spirit world through the moon, but only when played by Itsuki Mori. 
This song must be what was missing from the failed ceremonies of passage. They had no idea because they performed it in secret and nobody there was aware of it. You climb a ladder to the lighthouse's roof to find another shrine housing a large organ, the Gesho machine. Sakuya stands, or floats, in the centre, awaiting the eclipse. You do battle with her and despite the epic build up and the fact that it's a final boss battle, it plays out mostly the same as all the previous Sakuya battles, which is pretty disappointing. She might be slightly more aggressive this time, but at this point in the game she's no match for a fully upgraded Camera Obscura. Once she's defeated, you approach the Gesho machine and Ruka plays the Tsukimori song. Well, I mean, no. You play the song one last time and pray that you don't mess up and ruin the moment. As Ruka finishes off the song for you, Sakuya starts being cleansed and Ruka takes this as her chance to place the mask on her to quell the evil within her. However, she trips and the mask falls just out of reach. With barely any time left to stop Sakuya, who else steps in to save the day other than my main man Choshiro? He slaps the mask on Sakuya and calms her, giving a cool glance back to the fallen Ruka as he does so. Now with the ceremony of passage properly performed, a hole opens up in the water's surface in the reflection of the eclipsed moon. The trapped souls all begin to pass through Sakuya and travel onto the spirit world in the sea. Choshiro leaves. Sakuya leaves. But as she does so, her mask falls to the ground. A hand reaches for it, and we see Soya once again with his back turned to Ruka. She calls out to him, and he turns, this time revealing the face she'd forgotten. She now recalls the rest of her memory, allowing her to see his loving smile. He then joins the others, with Ruka crying out for him. We see the souls falling slowly into the abyss, soon to arrive at their destination. The screen fades to black. The game ends. And I want to cry. After the credits, we see Ruka sitting at a piano playing the lunar melody, just like at the start of the game. And although she plays the notes beautifully this time, they're filled with sorrow. It's a peaceful kind of sorrow though, one that comes from having regained her lost memories, but also the heartbreak that comes with them. And that's Fatal Frame, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse. Now, before we get into all post-story critiques and stuff, it's time for a quick final recap to explain a couple of the things I wasn't able to cover throughout for pacing reasons. So remember how people's souls are sound and that that sound is the lunar melody? Well, the way Luna Sedata Syndrome works is that the sound of all the dead people's melodies, who are stuck on the island because they haven't been sent to the afterlife, all overlap and drown each other out. This results in those who have LSS becoming unable to hear their own sound amongst all the others. This is why they gradually lose their memories, because memories are part of the soul. LSS always surfaces around the time of the festival, regardless of whether it's successful or not. This is partly because of the gradual build-up of souls stuck on the island, as well as the moon strengthening its spiritual connection with the islanders. Kind of like how Samhain, or Halloween to the non-nerds, is a brief time when the veil between the lands of the living and the dead is weakened. The last thing that's less missed information and more missed foreshadowing is that Mia being Misaki's doll is actually quite well hinted at by the details of her room. In it you find a baby's cot, which would only be used by a child of her age if they had a doll. You'll also spot a small black dress hanging in her closet, which is definitely too small for child Misaki to wear but a perfect size for a doll. Also, another thing I quite liked was that Mia's name, when broken up, is Mi, which means sea, and Ya, which means night, in addition to being a combination of their names. It's a name given by Sakuya, who almost definitely did so as a reference to the passage of the souls during the ritual. Oh wait, no, speaking of Misaki, whatever happened to her after chapter 8? Well, in the good ending, which is not the one I got, she is seen waking up next to Madoka after Ruka completes the ritual. She runs to her friend, dropping the Mia doll in the process. Madoka smiles and leads her out to Tsukiyomi Beach before joining the rest of the souls on their journey to the afterlife. It's presumed that she and Ruka meet up later and leave the island. How do you get this ending, you say? Well, I have no idea. For the life of me, I can't find out, but it's probably done by beating the game on a higher difficulty, like usual. Okay, now that that's settled, I really loved this game. It feels like such a fresh experience, while also retaining all the best qualities of the previous games. I went into it not knowing what to expect, because I'd stayed clear of all reviews and let's plays, but since completing it I've decided that, yeah, it's my new favourite fail frame game. Maybe even my new favourite horror game altogether. 
The new controls seem to be an issue for lots of people playing this game, but apart from my Wiimote disconnecting occasionally and having to switch to my mouse to do the piano segments, which are both only due to me playing on an emulator, the Wii control scheme didn't really bother me a whole lot. It's intuitive enough that I got the hang of it pretty quickly, which made exploration quite fun. The environments are wonderfully detailed, and the third person camera angle allows you to get up closer to things to inspect them. It's also more immersive, since you're able to cast your flashlight around the room like you would do in real life. Also, if I can stay completely immersed even with my remote doing this every time I use the camera or interact with the phone, then that's really saying something. While combat is generally fun due to the increased aggression of every enemy, the controls are a lot clunkier than when in third person. I'm not sure if this was just an issue with my emulator setup since the Wiimote wouldn't work at all during the piano sections, but the decision to tie both the character's backwards forwards movement with the sideways movement of the camera onto the nunchuck's analog stick while the Wiimote controls the upwards downwards motion of the camera is kind of baffling. Granted, that might not be the case with the official Wii version, and I got used to it fairly quickly anyway. Now, while I enjoyed combat, I do wish there was more enemy variety. I've never been fond of the generic, unnamed type of enemy that will repeatedly appear throughout the games. I much prefer how Fatal Frame 1 handled it, with fewer ghosts, but almost all of them had backstories and the ones that didn't usually had some incredibly distinguishing features like the weird cloud of smoke or the wandering monk. Also, regardless of how great the final boss fight was, narratively speaking, it kept up the tradition of being an underwhelming final fatal frame boss. The fact that you've already fought Sakuya several times throughout the game and she doesn't do much to differentiate in this fight is a real missed opportunity in my opinion. What she needed was either a tougher second form or to summon other enemies like the fight against the Utsuwa and Kanade. There really needed to be something more. Like imagine if she called in all the other islanders to fight against you. That'd be insane and incredibly memorable, but yeah, no. Puzzles were interesting in this game. I think they mostly struck a great balance between challenge and creativity, such as the control panels that require you to twist the Wiimote to turn the dial, which was pretty cool. I did miss the old way of removing spirit barriers though, where you replicate a photo you were shown. Instead, in this game, you just go to the location shown to you and grab an item. It's less interesting, and I think it was only done to include more instances of reaching for things. A couple of the puzzles were also way too forgiving. There's one moment where the solution to the puzzle was literally the puzzle itself. Also, the guiding spirits were a bit too frequent in some instances, where I already knew where I had to go but was led there anyway. The horror atmosphere in this game is absolutely stellar. When setting foot in each of the game's haunted locations, you feel every ounce of that dense, oppressive history weighing down upon you, dragging you further down into it. The insane amount of detail in the quiet halls, abandoned rooms, and overgrown outside areas does an amazing job of establishing a level of authenticity that creates a superb, immersive experience. When you explore the surgical wing of the hospital, you feel like you're really there, because all around you are shelves filled with medical research books, operating equipment, and a distinct sense of suffering. The ghosts in this game also contribute well to the atmosphere. Each one is tragic in their own way, and when they attack you, you get the sense that if they were of sound mind, they would leave you well alone. But since their minds were effectively wiped by Luna Sedata Syndrome, they have no hope of regaining their selves. I also enjoyed some of the random, well-crafted scares in the game, such as the moment you finish reading Tsubaki Tono's grave note and realise she's standing right there beside you, completely silent. That spooked the shit out of me. There's also a great scare where you reach for an item, and instead of picking it up or getting grabbed by a ghost hand, you're attacked by a ghost itself. As far as I'm aware, it's the only instance of this in the game, and it caught me completely off guard. The sound design is also fucking amazing. People often say Dead Space is the peak of horror game sound design, but I genuinely believe Fatal Frame 4 could give it a run for its money. There are so many instances where I was completely taken aback by how disturbing some of the sounds were. Things like the chaotic soundscape that filled Ayoko's bedroom, or the ghostly pained breathing I encountered in the room beyond it. These sent chills down my spine, much more so than any of the previous games. There's a great mixture of sinister and somber qualities to the game's sounds and music, and it made the experience incredibly memorable. 
One thing I didn't mention at all throughout the story was that you can find collectible dolls scattered throughout that when photographed will be exercised. I'm not sure how some of these dolls ended up where they are, but they were all created or given life by Sakuya, who was mentioned to have used dolls as a way to ground herself when suffering from LSS. It's a cool explanation for why they need to be photographed, as just like with Mia, she would have transferred some of her spiritual power to the dolls. In total, there are about 70 dolls, which is a lot. I thought I was doing a good job of finding all of them until I realised near the end of the game that I'd only collected about half of that. Some of them are in really tricky locations, which would be impossible to find without a camera function found later in the game that plays a little jingle whenever you're near one. I personally wasn't a fan of this feature as it would play while you were reading notes or during some cutscenes and it also seemed to transfer over to the other characters even though they hadn't found it, which was weird. With that said, finding the dolls is quite fun. It's like a spooky treasure hunt that has you searching every crevice of the game's environments for them, and any excuse to explore Rogetsu Island more is a good one to me. One thing I wasn't super fond of was the new item shop at the save points. Let me explain. So whenever you reach a save point, you can access a shop menu which will allow you to exchange your points for healing items or film. This, I'm sure, was implemented to make it easier for those struggling with the game to load up on supplies to get them past whatever obstacle they're stuck at. I respect that. However, it really breaks immersion for me as there's no logical explanation for you acquiring these items. Do the ghosts give them to you? Do you pull them out of the paper lanterns? Who knows? I won't lie, it did come in handy a couple of times when I was running low on healing items, but I'd rather the game have a better balance of supplies that you can find while actually exploring. What I loved about the first fail frame game in particular is that the amount of supplies you could find it was fairly limited, leading to some seriously tense moments where you desperately needed to find a save point without running into any more ghosts. Situations like that make you value healing items and supplies like your life depends on them. Because it does. But here you can load up on dozens of herbal medicines and strut into a boss fight with absolutely no worries. Then items you pick up become almost worthless because you've got 40 others just like it already. It's a bit of a nitpick, I know, but it detracts slightly from the survival aspect of survival horror. Another of the game's gimmicks that I have mixed feelings on are the spectral hands that occasionally snatch items away from you when reaching for them, which were inspired by one of Makoto Shibata's real life experiences. I generally like the idea of a ghost pranking you and taking away a possible precious resource. You know, now that I think about it, maybe this is why they added the shop to the save points. If not for the shop, this could be a great way to increase tension while exploring because you never know when it'll strike next. However, they're just too freaking fast. Not once did I manage to avoid the hand grabbing me, which you can do by simply cancelling the reach animation so the hand will miss yours. Every single time a hand appeared, it succeeded in stealing whatever it was I was about to pick up. Even when I solely focused on making sure to dodge the hand, it got me anyway. And it's not like I have slow reaction time. I used to quickscope in Call of Duty. I've got good reaction time. Yet, it was never good enough. I really hope they adjust this in the remaster to make it even just slightly easier to deal with. The story had me enraptured the entire way through, and each character, except maybe Madoka, was thoroughly fleshed out in a way that made you care for them and their personal journey. When I say I don't get emotional when playing games, I really mean it. I can't remember a single time I've gotten as sad as a game wanted me to, yet Mask of the Lunar Eclipse had me choking up at several points, even while writing this video. Each of the three protagonists, sorry again Madoka, went through very poignant journeys. Misaki and Ruka I guess were somewhat similar, with Choshiro not realising he had forgotten something until he remembered it, whereas the others went there with the intention of reclaiming those lost memories. I'm not sure whose story I enjoyed the most. Ruka had the most cathartic conclusion, having finally remembered what her father's face looked like. The mystery of Misaki's forgotten friend was consistently interesting and the reveal was probably better than I was expecting, being that she wasn't just some ghost of a dead friend, but the manifestation of a treasured spiritually sentient doll given to her by a dear friend who happens to be the game's antagonist. I mean, that's cool. Choshiro's story wasn't as interesting as the others, seeing as it mostly revolved around him chasing after Yohai Bara and serving as a lore dump what with the sheer amount of notes he finds, but the mysterious interaction with Ruka and the reveal that he died 8 years ago were some of the best moments in the game for me. It's not until after you finish his story that you realise in the glimpses you see of Yohai Bara, he's not a vision or a ghost. He looks alive, flesh and blood, but that's only because we see him from Cho's perspective, who we learn is also dead. 
I appreciate how each protagonist contributes a piece of the Master of the Lunar Eclipse to the final effort to stop the curse. Unlike some games, the characters' stories were all intertwined well enough that even though we don't really see them on screen together, the narrative doesn't feel divided in the slightest. Sure, everyone takes their own path, but their paths cross and rejoin at the end, making it all worth it. And the fact that Choshiro gets his chance to save Ruka again like a badass at the end from beyond the grave, ugh, chef's kiss. In addition to the characters' stories, I really enjoyed the story of the island and how its current state came to be. The combination, or should I say rivalry, between the ancient religious customs of Rogetsu Island and the boundary-pushing, mostly super questionable medical practices of director Haibara is such a refreshing concept to explore and learn about throughout the game. It's something that I haven't seen that often in video games, especially the Fail Frame series, which mostly just focuses on ritualistic practices. I loved finding notes describing how patients of Luna Sonata Syndrome were being treated, even if they were often extremely grim. And speaking of Luna Sonata Syndrome, I have to say I think this is my favourite curse in the series. Usually it's just some evil force that needs to be appeased and the whole game revolves around trying to calm it after a ritual went wrong. And I guess it's fairly similar here, but the purpose of the Ceremony of Passage isn't inherently negative. It's about sending the souls of the departed to the afterlife where they belong which is something that's celebrated in many cultures. It only takes a negative turn when a fundamental part of the ritual process is missing, which we see in the forgetting of the lunar melody after several tragedies and a world that's leaving the traditional cultures behind. The Luna Sedata curse itself is very similar to the real-life illness Alzheimer's. In case you're unaware or have forgotten, Alzheimer's is a disease that affects a person's memory, often leading to cases where they forget who they are, their loved ones, or even their place in time. We see elements of this in many facets of Failframe 4's curse. Sufferers of LSS begin to lose their memories, eventually leading to a point where they are completely foregone. The personalities of people who wear masks such as Soya begin to change, becoming almost an entirely different person, which is commonly said about those who suffer from Alzheimer's when they experience a lapse in current consciousness, for lack of a better phrase. Like with any mental disease, experimental procedures are carried out in attempts to cure it, sometimes with unfortunate results. We see the numerous attempts director Haibara makes in order to not only save the island's inhabitants from the curse, but also his daughter, Sakuya. He's made out to be one of the main antagonists of the game, but honestly he was just doing his best for his community. Some of his methods cross the line a little, sure, but after unveiling the story behind the game's events through reading notes, you don't get the sense that he did any of it purely out of malice. He did what he could with the tools and knowledge he had. It's just unfortunate that the only thing that stopped him from succeeding was one vital piece of information, forgotten and lost to time. In the beginning of the game, Ruka says that if something is forgotten, it ceases to have existed. If the lunar melody was forgotten, the ceremony of passage could never be performed, and if it was never performed, then the island's culture would cease to exist. The only way to save the souls residing on Rogetsu Island would be lost, trapping them forever. The game's themes do an excellent job of reinforcing the importance of memory and the lengths people will go to to be remembered after they're gone, or to remember those already departed. It's something everyone experiences, but only some suffer from. I myself value my memories and knowledge greatly, and my main goal in life is to leave something of myself behind to be remembered by. It's important to me to immortalise myself in some way so that when I'm gone I won't just disappear entirely from the world, lost with the fading memories of the last person who knew me. If I can pour a part of myself into a drawing, or a story, or even a freaking YouTube video, then there's a chance I will exist in this world for a little longer. Just like everyone who worked on this game will remain in this world for just as long as it does. A game, might I remind you, that was once restricted from becoming a memory of anyone in the West by a stubborn publisher, at least until dedicated fans made it possible in their stead. The remastered version is releasing soon, and I'm glad so many more people will have the opportunity to experience it. It gives it another chance at life, to become treasured memories in the minds of new and old fans. Fail Frame Mask of the Lunar Eclipse is wonderful, and I'm glad I got a chance to experience it. It's a beautiful, unforgettable horror game. A huge thanks to Tango Mushi for joining me on this video. It was a pleasure to work with her. If you enjoy my videos, I'm sure you'll enjoy hers. She also covers Japanese horror games and has some amazing videos on the Clock Tower series and its spiritual successors. Her video on Haunting Ground is particularly good. There's a link to her channel in the description of this video and I urge you to follow it. Thanks for watching.